First of all, I'd like to welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming. We have uh, everyone here physically in person, uh, all of our partners. Uh, my name is Susan Zero, and I'm your moderator for today. Um, I represent the Bahrain Fintech Bay. Um, we also have, if, in the camera over here, we have actually quite a few people online. So I'd like to welcome them as well. We've got people from actually all over the world, from the USA to, believe it or not, Chile. We've got India. We've got uh, Saudi Arabia. We've got so many other countries that are out there. So welcome, and thank you for joining us here in Bahrain. And thank you again for all of you to join us. I'd just like to start a little bit um, and, and talk about, because I know that we have a lot of our partners here, but perhaps some of you that are a part of their organizations don't know very much about Bahrain Fintech Bay. So I'm going to, before I introduce the panel, I'm just going to give a little, very short brief on what we do. So Bahrain Fintech Bay was established in 2018 as a national initiative um, to further develop the Fintech ecosystem. That was a mandate of ours. And we began in 2018 and around the, uh, I'd say about 60 fintech at the time. Um, what we do, we participate in things like where you are right now. This is actually our kitchen, we're in our kitchen, but it's also our event space. Um, and we conduct a lot of awareness uh, uh, with its events to do with things like this, where we talk about verticals and you know future trends. We also talk about uh, different subject matter where the, their latest data reports that we've done and so on. That's one of the things we do to raise awareness. And then if you look behind you, uh, we have our co-working space for the people online Behind the cameras, we have a co-working space, our incubation space, where we have around 35 residents that are fintechs. Um, and we also do acceleration. So we do programs with our founding partners to further accelerate uh, fintechs. So what else do we do? We do fintech talent and uh, developing the talent in Bahrain in terms of fintech. We do research reports. Uh, last one we conducted with Bahrain Fintech Ecosystem Report at um, the end of last year. It's also downloadable on the website if you like. Uh, we do, of course, we do solution sourcing for our partners. Um, we don't actually invest in our fintechs, but we have a pipeline of investment, uh, that, uh, investment partners that we can hook up our fintechs with as well. So just to give you a little brief uh, about what we do. And uh, it's quite a lot, and I'm very happy to see that we've been here now as a fifth year running. Um, and welcome again. Hi, uh, hi, Ahmed. Welcome. So we basically uh, welcome you to this event that we're partners with our fintech partners, code based technologies, building the banks of the future. Um, without further ado, I've talked a bit about myself. I'd like to introduce our panel. So we have, I guess I'll start that way. So it's Saad and Sari, who's CEO of Expense. Welcome, Saad. Hi, thank you, Susie. Good to be here. Pleasure. Okay, we have Dr. Ahmed Darwish, who's the head of Digital Solution yeah. of Bilal Bank. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you. And we have Roberto Mancoy, who's the CEO and executive board uh, member of Beyond Money. Welcome, Roberto. Thank you, everybody. And last but not least, we have Ahmed Adil, who is the regional sales for code based technologies. So I'm glad to be here. Welcome, everyone. So I guess we'll sort of kick it off. In the last seven years or so, we've seen we've seen a 20% increase in neo banks, of which about 35% of them are in EMEA. And we've also seen um, about uh, let's say about 60% of the population is under 30 years old. To add to that as well, by this year 2026, we're going to have uh, two thirds of the population with 5G. Uh, connectivity. So there's a lot going on. What we're here today to discuss is, you know, what the individual services and what are the trends and what's shaping now what's going on. I guess one of the key things uh, that we need to talk about first is what are some of the drivers that happen. So I, I'm going to put out to review. Maybe uh, we talked on the phone. Maybe Doctor, uh, you'd like to sort of kick about all the drivers behind all of this. Well, yeah. right, first of all, customer is the first driver of any. Transformation or change normally in the in the community or in the ecosystem. I believe today we have uh, Generation D is becoming a key customer for us in banking industry and financial sector. So those people are really uh, native. They like to do everything digitally. So they are uh, aiming and looking for everything to be digitalized. The, some of them don't know even about the old uh, way of doing things in banking and visiting a branch or where is the branch even. So so the customer uh, is, is the first driver. I think even um, the reality of customers today is not like before. Before the customer used to have one bank and uh, being yeah stuck with that bank and uh, really uh, attached to it. Today, the customer in a few seconds, if he don't see or feel a good experience with any application, you will change the application in, in less than a minute. So today, without having a good customer experience, 
for different uh, powerful for sure uh, generations. This will make us losing a customer. For sure, losing a customer is much expensive than bringing a new one. Uh, so because bringing a new one is going to be uh, hard, and losing the customer is going to cost us a lot. Uh, this is the main driver. The second driver is the regulation. Today, open banking and giving the customer the power really on the data that he owns or she owns is driving the community into open banking, which is going to make a revolution to the uh, banking industry because majority of the service now the customer is getting from a single bank or two banks will be uh, given by the front end the players who are the new uh, TPDs working across the globe. So I UK uh, standard and experience uh, in leading, but GPT now we are doing great. Bahrain was uh, leading in open banking here. UAE and Saudi Arabia now is moving also toward that. We are working in Saudi with uh, Saba in implementing uh, phase one. And uh, phase two is coming, and now we start talking about the new use cases for this. Um, as third thing is the vision 2030 we have in Saudi, is driving the financial sector aggressively toward having uh, better financial uh, services for the uh, community. Uh, financial inclusion is part of that driver. So instead of having a uh, high percentage of people living and working in the, in the kingdom or in any country, now don't have financial uh, institute or bank where they have an account. For example, in Egypt, you have over 69% uh, of the population don't have bank accounts. So this is a financial institution, if you can say. So in Saudi, this number dropped into maybe 31%, which is also very high still. So some people, because of the identity and because of other things, but financial inclusion is one of the drivers for us to move into uh, digital banking. Thank you. Did you need to add anything? Yeah. Is you'd like to add yeah, actually, I would like to add something more uh, about the generation Z. Uh, definitely, as yes, the generation Z and millennium now are uh, our end customer. But actually, there is one more aspect we have to we have to look at, at it. That if you check about this, the new um, the new Capricorn, okay, the new um, the new Unicode, sorry, the new Unicode. I'm Capricorn. 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 The new the new Unicode, okay. It's actually. Uh, started by uh, the millennials. So these are driving this business. If you check about Venmo, there is a company called Stripe in, uh, in, uh, in, in Ireland. It's now evaluated by 20 billion. They started in 2008 by two brothers. One of them was 19, was 21, and 20 billion dollars now evaluation. Not bad for two kids, definitely. Okay. <laughs> but actually, moreover, for the Generation Z and for the millennials. You know what, five years ago, they asked the university students in the US, 80% of them stated that they prefer to visit the dentist than to go to the bank, okay. Okay. to that extent. So that's that's actually, that was, a, for, for them, it was a horrible experience, and now they are driving this system, and now they are innovating the system. So that's actually, that's how I, do, but I think that's my main drivers of the future dynasty. Anyone else? Maybe just about comments is not heard about Generation Z or what we bang on now, we're reading Generation Y. I think there are, in any kind of uh, changes, there's the main driver is technology, it's not democracy. Right? Technology first, imagination after. If you put that together, then you have success and you allow innovation. The first is technology, then can regulation comes after when technology creates something which is uncontrollable. And then the generation is born with something that didn't exist before. So uh, as a consequence, uh, any new generation, every five years, 10 years, we have something and we experience it because we're doing today something that we did not even do 10 years ago, right? All of us forget about banks, but in entertainment, uh, uh, streaming, uh, you go back to the, the famous names. And this inevitably implies the fact that why we on a daily basis are using a device, which is a portable device that access to any kind of information, that inevitably we want also the same with financial services. Our mind is already prone and set to non-loyalty, like you said, correct? And at the same time, having something. New. So we need to always create a demand because there will be an evolution of requests. But if we don't create the demand, that is not requested by the market. 
Sorry, well said. So I thought I don't want to add anything more. Uh, I, I think I think the gents will have said it all. <laughs> well, going forward with that and talking about you know uh, the drivers, and I think you hit on some of uh, Doctor, you hit on some of the trends. Let's just before we move into the technical side of it, let's just talk about some maybe fabulous things, some of the trends that we're seeing now. I and mean, you mentioned a couple of, uh, on your side, but what are the, what are the sort of trends we're seeing in terms of the changes and the industry? I think um, like, I, I'm quite biased to put the FME side because that's what we've uh, like, in probably the last four or five years in our region. Now we're starting to see um, the entrepreneurs focusing on the SME. A lot of, you know, you mentioned financial inclusion earlier. A lot of financial inclusion, we tend to talk about individuals. Um, you know, uh, quite often this become a cliche now, SME is the backbone of every economy. Yet try opening a bank account as an SME and how difficult and challenging it is across the world. It's not something specific to Bahrain or any of the other Gulf countries. It is a challenge. And so one of the trends that we're starting to see, and you can see it from the investment perspective as well, that VCs are, or investors are moving to putting their money into the B2B side of things. So that's one of the, I think, the trends. And we'll see it more and more in the Gulf and in the Arab world in, in the coming 18, 24 months. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I believe in the I'm glad to uh, add to what uh, Mr. Sand has mentioned, that one of the uh, starting uh, innovative ideas that we have in venture that was for SME to open accounts online. And that was happening since 2019. And uh, yeah, we have, we have yeah, we, um, uh, learned the lesson about their, how it's difficult for them to open accounts and how they are suffering to run their business. Banks are not supporting them a lot. Maybe you can add uh, 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 some, this, uh, some points from your experience in SME. But uh, venture Black was considering SME from the beginning of the digitalization, the journey of moving customers from opening accounts on the branches to, uh, to the online. Um, we were also thinking about multiple owner uh, account opening, but when COVID-19 came, we stopped that project because we expected that there would be no much multiple owner companies to open accounts. So uh, SME is, a, is an important sector. Uh, recently, we have met with the Saudi payment in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. And we have been talking about having specific solutions for this segment because they are, until now, they are the least segment getting uh, good services from the financial sector. Yeah, say the same. Unfortunately, yeah, while they are, as, as mentioned now in, by Ahmed and by Isa, they are driving the economy and they are the main lesson um, player in, in the growth of any economy. Saudi Arabia has an objective within the Vision 2030. But the GDP uh, share of SMEs up to 30%, which is already how the reach it last year. So by by time, I think this segment is, is taking the focus and getting more and more uh, services from uh, everywhere. Wonderful. Yeah, and I think one wants to ask one of your trends that we've seen in general. No, I'm fine. I just want to have one note about that, that of moving this, uh, the VC moving to the SMEs because of the coming recession they are seeking about. Actually, this is one of the main things that can push this recession to be more safe. We are going for a recession in 2023 by any means, but how hard is this will be the recession? This is the new question. So, uh, governments are looking to the SMEs to, uh, to, to pump money in that. Actually, for this recession, uh, I believe they will, we, we have a great, a great growth rate about this SMEs in the coming 24 months, as Sam said. In terms of trends, I mean, uh, unfortunately, COVID uh, forced many of us to have remote business, but at the same time, in the financial industry, we created also an education and in terms of facilitating the accessibility to digital devices, because it was not our way around. Uh, specifically in the remittance business, which is typical in regions so or international transfers. Especially in the population as you see, where 50% of the population is very much expanded. And these expands produce GDP in this country, but at the same time export GDP. And uh, so that the, the remittance is one of the highest FDI foreign direct investment in the receipt accounts. Now, the moment in GCC is the multi billion dollars per annum, the UAE array, several billions of dollars. Uh, only 20 25% is digital. The rest is still physical. So, brick and mortar branches, uh, people stay in line, or also, unfortunately, because many are also literate, people having this kind of a 
trusted solution where they give away their cars, they give it away their team, have somebody else pick up cash on their behalf and send money out, which inevitable risks. Now, that 80% of the multi billion dollar business is something, of course, the digital uh, propositions are trying to practice. We, for those of you who maybe don't know, we have money and we are providing not only the car business, but also the maintenance business, fully digital. In a way, we facilitate financial inclusions because, in a way, we try to create an easy way for people that don't even have the password in their hands because they don't have the freedom of having that password to be onboarded directly by just faith recognition, a simple CPR ID without any password. And that is not because we neglect the information, but because we are using an ecosystem here in Bahrain to the IGA to benefit to pull all those information, which of course are already recorded in the government, instead of asking that person, give me your password, show the password and hit the uh, device if they don't have access to it. And I think this is an example of digitalization, financial inclusion, and hopefully education to move them away from cash. Well, I guess we can't be using the lack of things financial inclusion. So I was going to ask you a question because there's something that has said would expand basically you focus on um, you know, helping business and scale. And then I guess I wanted to ask you earlier because we were talking about uh, you know, why is it expensive you choose to work purely with us? I mean, so is it is it carrying on from thinking? Sure. I, I think that the that's kind of the reasons why we did it. I think first and foremost is the passion for entrepreneurship. So um it's helping other people to launch and scale their businesses. So our vision isn't by banking service, it's to help you launch and scale. Um and then I think the other thing is that you know we we often talk about you know, when you're when you want to solve a problem, is it a painkiller or a vitamin? Um, are people willing to pay to solve this problem? My my opinion is, is that in the majority of cases on the consumer side, they resent having to pay for banking services. Why should I pay to deposit money? Why should I pay a minimum balance fee? Whereas in from a business perspective, you cannot run a business without a bank account. And therefore, people, businesses will be more willing to pay. So it becomes a more sustainable business model. So I, I would say those are probably the two prim primary reasons. And then also, no one's doing anything about it. Um, it as an either stuck in this um, space between the corporate and the retail side of the bank, and you will go to one bank and SME sits with corporate. You'll go to another bank, they sit with retail. And they just don't know. It's like kind of the unwanted yeah. child of the... <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. I think there's some other firms recently as well, though, to, to sort of identify some of those pain points. I know that we have heard, heard this as being one of the things that they want to, you know, make sure that they pay attention to here in Bahrain. So I, I think that's, that's, you know, that's a good enough, you know, for us. I think we can hear that all the time with our, our business. But there is a pain point with that, so... But I would like to actually go back to you. Um, I was going to say, I will know, something like Ahmed. Um, let's, I want to talk a little bit more technical in terms of with code based technologies, you are basically developing cutting edge, edge banking solutions. Oh, what I want to ask you is, is how do you decide uh, what you want to focus on? How do you decide what kind of features you want to develop? Uh, and what, and, and what, and how do you prioritize that as well? Okay, it's actually usually it's case by case that we do because um, it's not only one decision, you know, it's not only the main decision, there's some strategic and functional thing aspect. What you always do is we agree on an MVP, minimum viable product. What actually what makes sense to the bank is be on an MVP level right now to be up and running the fastest to the market. And actually, this is what we're talking about digitalization because the um, digitalization is actually we can think about the digitalization for like two years, but actually the digitalization is how to, how how far to reach the market. It's one cake, okay? So if you reach faster, you can monetize faster and you can reach the segment faster. That's that's what we believe in code-based technologies. So for us, it's always a consultation between code base, what we can see, because a lot of, actually, if you hear about that, a lot of bank, digital banks, they are losing. Why they are losing? Because they thought that if they have a, a, an onboard money, so, okay, good luck, you have a digital bank, but actually you are losing tax because banking actually make a, make a profit only through lending. So an MVP as a code base, we always say, okay, you will, you will have the onboarding, the very nice uh, journey of the digitalization, but you must have at least one mode of, of lending because that will make, make you monetize, uh, monetize your, your investment. That's one, that's one point. Another point is 
usually banks, as I, as I 10 years now, more than 10 years working with banks, a procurement cycle of bank takes up to one year. Okay, it's nine months and 10 months and one year. Not because banks are bad, um, kind of, but, 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 because, but because banks are, <laughs> banks are very high regulated. Banks are regulated five times more than any other industry. So this mindset, this procurement side, this mindset is not that we don't have this entrepreneurship mindset. That's why banks handle that. They said, okay, we don't have to do everything. We can have uh, we can have a cooperation with a fintech like SAM to produce our products. So, so we, it, we don't have to be everything. So we, all together, we can generate a one product that it's, it's really important to the bank and make them monetize, and then we scale up and we scale out. No, I just like to like some advice from my catch on my work to say that. You know, I don't want to use bank to as a bank and you're being kind of you know digital solutions actually going out to look for them. Yeah. I mean, how would all this all this coming at you? What how do you prioritize you know what you want to? So, oh, for sure, and uh, maybe I disagree on some points, even uh, what has been mentioned that technology is a driver for the transformation. Uh, from banking side, we don't see this. We see that the, the customer and uh, prioritization in the driver for the transformation, then technology is an enabler for us to, to achieve that. Uh, I was I was a vendor for uh, maybe 50% of my uh, life in Fujitsu and IBM. So I can see also the other side of the story. But uh, when I when I am working in the bank as a banker, I think we are seeing it from the opposite. Um, uh, not, not completely uh, ignoring the technology and importance of it. Technology is definitely is our enabler, but we start the subject from the strategy of the bank uh, going down into the tactics and how we initiate these uh, initiatives to reach our strategy, uh, to achieve our strategy. Uh, first of all, uh, we have five drivers or five strategic objectives where we filter whatever initiative is coming to us to think about. So not any initiative can be accepted, first of all, in our list of initiatives. And maybe if someone here from bank side, he can uh, understand what I'm saying exactly. Then we have another level of prioritization according to a score card or something like a prioritization matrix. Uh, we have two streams. One stream is that, okay, there's a competitor who has this solution and providing the service or products digitally to customers. So should we focus on developing the same? Or should we go for the other stream where we are being the innovative bank, the first to produce uh, another product or service with us? In 2018, and, and as I mentioned, that it's becoming a law now to onboard customers. That at that time was not a uh, the law. It was something, wow. Okay, so even to convince Sam and the country to account uh, opening in uh, completely digital and without seeing the customer physically, that was really a challenge. Today, this is becoming a role. So what happens, as Ibrahim mentioned, you should look for other uh, service and products. So we are always in, in a trade uh, of between being innovative and produce something really new and focus on being the first to produce this and make a change to the community and the ecosystem, rather developing the, the things that are regularly happening in the market and other banks are doing as competitors. And in our school card, by the way, if this idea is already in the market, we give it zero in the score of being innovative. And when this is really in a new, a new solution or someone else didn't do, and we are going to be the first one to do, we give it 10 in that score. So prioritization is based on uh, objective scale, not a uh, subjective one. But uh, data-driven decisions also to prioritize our things is, is one of the key drivers. But in, in general, we, we look uh, after the strategy and the trade-off between being the first to produce versus what the actors are doing. Okay, with that, <laughs> yeah, I'd like to go actually to an interesting you know, telcos are now entering financial services. We have beyond and the uh, even point of uh, basically acquiring all the banking licenses. You were the first as well to adopt the uh, in the GC to have the uh, the open banking licenses telco. And it's very interesting to see that coming into play. And what I'd like to hear a bit more, you started it a little bit before, 
But on what is your difference? So how is Beyond playing in terms of traditional banking and as a telco? And what is Beyond's role in that? I think we take the advice, we we'll take the long yes, way. Well, when uh, almost two years ago, maybe more than two years ago, the telco management team contacted me. Um, I come from a banking background, from almost 30 years of background from a retail banking, private banking, corporate banking, your SME banking, uh, both from distribution, sales, etc. And it was a telco asking me, how do we do, how do we go live? What is the strategy? What are we going to do here? And for me, from Italy, it was COVID, so the entire conversation was long distance, was, well, I need to understand exactly what the regulation is in Bali, and uh, in order to understand what we can do. And once we understood the regulation, and we realized that without being a bank, Central Bank of Bahrain allows fintechs to provide what we call ancillary businesses, and I said, well, then we can take some verticals. We can issue cards, we can do remittances, we can open banking, we can provide investment products, and so forth. So we can create... The products the clients want without really being a bank. So that was the, the initial idea. And then so behind that, they can put them all in one container, and this container becomes the actual Beyond app. Then the clients will go there, and it doesn't matter if you're blue collar, white collar, retailer, young kids, or an uh, investment uh, person. So we don't need to put you in the category. We don't want to be the app of the blue collar, the, white, the, the, the app of the kids, or the app of the retailer, or the, the app of the affluence. Whatever you like, you will find. Now, this was, of course, the vision. Then, of course, you go to fast forward, okay, fine, we have the money, we make it happen, make months, we have a launch. And when in January 2021, we launched almost one year ago, for those of you that maybe remember, we downloaded the app. We were courageous because we said, let's go live with one product. And we had one product, and the others were coming soon, coming soon, coming soon. Right? <laughs> but deliberately, right? Because we want to say, we're not ready yet, right? But we want you to be happy with one product we have. But the problem is that every two months we will launch something new. Every two months we change the face of the app. Every two months we have something that the others don't have. And then we try to create this kind of engagement with the audience because, of course, we promised that. And fortunately, many clients, maybe they get bored with the app. And then two months later, say, well, let me look at this new feature. Let me see if maybe I'm not interested in maintenance, but I'm interested in the connected banks. I'm interested in the investment kind of liquidity. So this is the story that we wanted to create. This was number one. And of course, we started with the strength of Batelco behind, but the first year of the bigger team, we decided not to leverage the Batelco client base, which was also not a courageous act. We didn't want to call it Batelco Finance, right? we call it Beyond Money. We did not even mention the word finance Batelco. And in fact, 50% of our client base is non Batelco, and 50% is Batelco. Now, at this point, after one year, we are maturing, we are becoming, of course, bigger, thanks uh, to the audience and uh, the clients that decide to follow us. Now, of course, we're willing to leverage also the tech of clients and say, okay, fine, if you're a tech of client, maybe we have a better offer. Today, for example, we launched a remittance office and offers which will give a certain discount, 50% discount, if you're a tech client. If you're not, then you still have the price, which is better than a competition. Now, why are we pushing in this direction? And the number one, we definitely leverage the, um, the regulations or the licenses that we had available. And number two, also, we want to create a solution which is like a container. Some products will be ours, some products will not be ours. So some products will be offered by banks, some products will be offered by other fintechs. For example, should we decide one day to do SMEs or any other solutions? Because we cannot think of creating state-of-the-art solutions with our own technology. There are two elements always that are money, right? It's uh, resources and timing. And then we need to be fast. And similar to what you do in terms of your product scorecard, I had also another component in my team, which is competition. We have a sprint every two weeks, maximum one month. That month, I put the team together and you compete. We have one slot, who's going to go first? Right? So we put them in competition, obviously. So the card they had the card, one has product, they had the remittance, one had this product, they had an investment, one had this product. We put them in competition based on resources. And whichever comes first with the business analysis, planning and development comes first. So, but of course, we can do that in a fintech. Oh, my toe is I understand. I understand it would be more difficult in a bank, but of course, that's probably the advantage of it. Right. That was fascinating. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to ask that. I'm sorry. I'm going because the next question I'm actually afraid to ask. <laughs> so, I mean, we it's basically on that in the 2018, we've seen on fintechs and banks against each other rivals. My question is, and I think we're very probably have a final answer with some of that, but fintechs and banks. Can we work together? Are we working together? And what are your feelings on that? Because I can feel it. Okay, 
that's uh, actually when we, when we hear about Fantex, we think that it's a very new thing, right? Like a cryptocurrency or something. However, actually, ATM, when they invented in the 70s, was a Fantex, was a financial technology, okay, for, through the financial, so, uh, it was, with the technology using a financial. What, what has changed lately that in the, in the past, in historically, that um, we use the financial, uh, we use the financial innovation, what the big banks with this guru money, you know, having this, or uh, having this credit cards, uh, creating credit cards, creating ATMs. But now, actually, that anyone can code and have a pen tech, right? He can create something, he can create a product, and he can code, so he can, he can be a pen tech. The point here is that. However, some of the banks are still want to do everything, right? Morgan Stanley, for example. Morgan Stanley has developers more than Facebook and Twitter together, okay? They want to do everything. But few of the banks will be succeeding to that. Few, very, very few. Because, not because big banks, as we said, not because banks are bad, because actually banks are built for the industrial revolution. They built, they've been built around papers. Checks, ledgers, cash. They don't, they, they have never been built for a digital. Actually, when the people create banks and after the revolution, after the world war II, they couldn't believe that there is something could be a digital, uh, a digital product. However, now banks have learned that, and Dr. Ahmed can tell me more about that, and even uh, Roberto can tell me more on San, that now we don't have to be everything. We can use our competitor to have a wider ecosystem. Them, and I win, the fintech win, and actually the customer win. Okay? So I believe that in the coming years as well, fintechs and banks will work more together. How do you feel about that? <laughs> For sure, I totally agree. And uh, in, in Saudi Arabia, we have two schools. Uh, one school, which I don't believe on, and I don't belong on, alhamdulillah, because uh, I'm working with Bank of Language, we are happy to serve fintechs and to partnership with together. The other side is that we are uh, looking after themselves and like to build fintechs themselves for themselves. So this is really, um, it's it might be uh, a good approach, but it's not the best approach because doing everything by yourself is not, and it's stolen by time. I mean, we all know how outsourcing uh, model uh, being successful since two decades. And Microsoft for sure was one of the pioneers in that industry. Um, building everything by yourself is going to cost you time and money and effort. And the flexibility that Spinnix has today, especially from a regulatory perspective, uh, is going to be a very um, value added uh, aspect when it comes that you collaborate with them. Because today, as a bank, you need much time and effort, and you are not that agile as them. To, to reach to the markets. They have their own customer base, they have their own ideas. Um, banking uh, industry is there for more than a century, but so today, fintechs are solving problems that banks were not able to solve before. So if I don't support those uh, any companies and players, I'm not gonna support the end customer at the end. So if the customer is my customer, in the case of open banking, so I'm sending my customer through them as TPP, or I'm serving their customers, okay, as a, as a uh, banking as a service for Pentex. In both cases, the customer is going to benefit from these solutions, and agility is going to be there with the Pentex companies. Uh, problems that we were not able to solve before as banks, now they are going to be able to solve. Even for them, sometimes they have problems we were able to solve based on our banking experience. And the final uh, point which I need to mention is that we are not aware of the regulatory uh, and the regulation uh, aspects like banks. So when they came to us, sometimes they are not aware even of account opening regulation from Sarah and how they can uh, work with banks. So there are a lot of aspects that can encourage and should encourage this collaboration between banks and fintech companies. But this, at the end of the day, will serve the whole community uh, and the customer will get innovative solutions. Today, Kalimpe, for example, in Saudi Arabia, they were facing an issue to um, uh, get the payments uh, out to their uh, captains. And when you take over or Kalim, sometimes they say, okay, are you paying cash or credit card? If you are paying credit card, you say, sorry, I cannot pay this truck. And this was very annoying to every single person of our family. So today, 
uh, we in the bank, we give Kareem a, a solution so they can pay out the driver on each trip or at the end of the day for the whole day trips. So now captains of Kareem don't resist in any kind of card uh, uh, payments for, for their uh, trip. So such kind of solutions can touch any and, and, and each person. Uh, back to the um, uh, remittance service, which Roberto was talking about. Uh, in 2019, we were the first bank to open accounts also for new callers online. And by having a jet application from Bank Albilet, instead of people in, the, in front of the branches, even going outside or reaching, the like queue reaching outside the branch during the salary days, today you can go to the branch and find almost maybe two or three people there. Because maybe they are not aware of having this application. So today we have over 50%. I'm sure I'm that each speaker today, maybe you have reached 60. Our, our, our the remittance transactions to bank event are done now online. So there is no need of that. So there is no need for visiting the just bench. And for sure, in general, now it's becoming a public company. So we have all to spend out this company out. So I, I mean that helping Phoenix should be the new, let's say, uh, message that's our, or let's say, vision. Okay, so we're all saying we're working together. Imagine joining us, where's it then? I think, um, you know, over the past four or five years, mm -hmm. I've, I've met banks across the region so, and regulators. I think um, uh, what we, what I kind of do is I group the banks into legacy technology and legacy mindset. And okay. depending, on, depending on what combination you get, we'll decide whether you can go with this um, Bank or not, and and typically where the blocker is always in is the mindset, right? We work with banks that don't necessarily have the, the the core system that will allow us to do what we want to do, but they still have the will, and we find a way to make it happen. Um, I think things are starting to get better. Uh, just a little bit about our journey. I want to just talk a bit about Bahrain fintech. Really. Why did we come from the UAE to Bahrain and start up? because this was probably the friendliest place to start a contact business. You guys were here, the regulator was open to talk to us and the banks. So the mindset of all of, of the ecosystem was in the right, it was the right frame of mind. And so we came here and we said, oh, this is where we can do our proof of concept. This is where we can do our MVP and then launch into the other markets. And, and we were right. We, we found the right partners here um, to be able to do that, which we were struggling in other markets. So if anyone wants to start a fintech business, come to that range. Well, that was good advertising. But that's it. It's I'm interesting to you do say you part of what you both talked about was the mindset. Like your bank is very open. You're willing to, to adapt. I mean, I mean, reverse to come from all over the place. So you can, you can probably add something to that. I, I tend to agree, especially with the last evening person, uh, because one thing that uh, definitely is a leading existing or probably existing kind of ecosystem here is the fact, maybe because the brain is small, right? So, never being small means, of course, you have a strong network. But I remember when we had the announcement of our brand, it was a ceremony at the first season last year. Well, to be honest, as a European, I have to admit, I said, this will never happen in Europe. Right. We were there, we were presenting the brand. I was on stage, and on that day, we had the governor of central banks, we had executives of central banks, and we had all the CEOs of banks. And a few days ago, Binance was the same. They, they had the announcement, right? And again, same routine, right? Same protocol, which means, of course, there is a strong message of uh, unity and try to create something which determines the value from Bahrain and for Bahrain and then from Bahrain. Outside, I think this, this is something which culturally you will not see repeated in any other part of, of the world, especially in Europe, here or Anglo Saxon. So it, it's an asset which I think you can find here and you should cherish. Um, in, in terms of um, uh, cooperation between fintech and banks, again, so if I have to say the example, we are the only B two C solution that we are at. we provide the connectivity with banks through the open banking uh, API and open banking framework established by the central bank. Uh, does it work? Not perfectly. We are making sure that the entire banks, central banks now solve, we, we improve it. Did we know that it was not work perfectly? No, because obviously it was impossible. There was a regulation, there was a framework, but nobody came out with a product. We were the first one coming back with a product and said, well, it could be improved, right? It works, connectivity is there, technically it's there, but user experience is not the best. 
In fact, if you notice, we don't even call it open banking in our app. Because clients don't even know what open banking is, right? Good luck explaining that to them. Yeah. We just say, connect your bank and see your data. Because that's what we do, right? So there are some certain terminology which is very technical. We should leave it to the regulator and the people in the fields. And other terminology which have to be addressed to the clients and completely different matter. Otherwise, you're scared. So this is an example of cooperation where we're now working together in order to improve, and not only improving the connectivity, what we always say to the banks is, if you give us your data, you think for the first time that you, we are stealing data from you, right? Passing the data of your clients from the bank to your money, you say, why should I do that? The difference is that if you have four banks, right, and you decide to connect with your money, your money allows you to see your entire position, cars, wallets, uh, deposits, investment with your four banks. But your bank doesn't know that you have maybe the car with them, the salary with another bank, and the investment with another bank, with the credit card with another bank. So you maybe categorize that client as a retailer, maybe it's an effort. Or you categorize a retailer, maybe it's a private wealth in the retail. But you can give back those data to the banks in an anonymized way, with respect to PDPL, of course. And this is the kind of exchange between FinTech and banks. You think that we're taking data from you, we're happy, we're giving back enriched data for credit scoring, for classification of clients. And if we understand this game, then I think there is a great value for the system. It's all very well said. And I'm sure everybody's got questions. And, and thank you very much, Jens. Well, I'd like to open up because I, there's a lot here. And I'm sure a lot of you have questions. Um, maybe do I need my microphone? Uh, I can start with you. Uh, where are we? Uh, I am trying to uh, make my own uh, ethic applications. Uh, I just want to know uh, from the presentation, thank you so much for your contribution, but I can categorize you at two fintechs and two banks. It was uh, right, almost. So I don't think you want to be a bank. How can I approach you or you or you? How can you give me uh, um, a chance to help uh, me work with uh, aesthetics and banks. If I, I am right, okay, I, I don't want to talk about as a, as a CEO of your money, right? But I, I can tell you that you can experience all similar to FinTech play by any foresight in the but also accelerator programs. And, and I think that you are in the, in the right setting right now, sitting here, and, uh, and it's difficult for a FinTech to knock on doors, regardless if they are FinTech or banks. Maybe FinTech is lost normally the management of this piece, in that case, with the venture capital, uh, particular priorities, and they don't want to be distracted by their roadmap, which is creating value. Right? Uh, banks, uh, sometimes you hit the wall against procurement uh, and policies. Uh, so you have the most wonderful idea, but good luck trying to go through the hurdles of uh, procurement. So I think definitely, as long as you can, you should. Uh, Show the idea to an audience, which can be similar to buying FinTech Bay, which can filter, help, support, and you check, exactly. uh, and, and then ask them to leverage the network, right? And then, of course, they can present to banks, uh, FinTechs, uh, and, and sometimes, sometimes magically, maybe the, the magic happens because maybe your idea is something that we have thought in our impact uh, or our mind for months, and maybe you have it, right? Although that doesn't, it doesn't mean it's certainty that your idea will be bought. Because each one of us, I'm sure, we always are in front of the question, should I make or buy? Right? Because your idea means if you did it, we can do it. Right? So either your idea is somehow challenging at a better stage and much more competitive in terms of development, because you as a fintech probably you have an idea, but you have no clients. Obviously, at the yes. beginning is inevitable. All of us with our with zero clients. Right? But if your idea is valuable, then say, why should I go through the development phase if maybe I can? When I say buy, it doesn't mean it's an investment, but it means in partnership and investment of the story. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe what's your uh, business first? Which idea that you are bringing to the market, or this is still confidential? Uh, it's, uh, it's an app to facilitate uh, getting car loads. Car loads. Okay. So, uh, auto lease. Uh, yeah, in a way, no matter. Yeah. Right. Uh, well, in vain, normally, first thing that we ask the fintech company of which you know is about your business. For sure, this could be from some banks is a competition, but we as bank regulators never see this as a competition because you are bringing us a customer 
who might be a customer of another bank. So as mentioned here, it's it's about collaboration. It's not about competition. This is the first point. The second point is that, um, uh, and we have this case for Kalim after we have helped Mobile Pay to open their uh, wallets. We are the trusted bank for Mobile in Saudi Arabia to open their wallets. So our APIs now for a lot of uh, financial services are, are ready. Uh, maybe I've been talking today to Ahmed Adel about uh, one of the solutions to make this as a, as a platform instead of that we build every bits and pieces of it. So today we are ready with a large number of APIs which we can help fintechs to uh, consume. Uh, going out of the procurement process and what uh, our colleagues here uh, they have mentioned, we are just signing an NDA and free agreements. We don't want more of a complete uh, process for uh, collaboration. So once you sign these two agreements with us, we start collaborating. We have workshops where your business team and our business team, then your technical team and our technical team are working together to build a solution. Sometimes the solution might be ready. Just like the case of Kalim, we have just consumed our capitalized uh, on one or two APIs, which we have already uh, developed for mobile. And if not, we can work together to develop those APIs for you, like the case we have for another uh, company in Saudi called Hala, for point of sale aggregation. So uh, this is the process. However, the speed in terms of development, we're talking about something like three weeks up to maybe two, three months, which might be the solution is that we have on this. But we're not talking about the old days of banks where we have to take years to develop a solution because we know how fast and how short. Uh, your solution come fast to the market. So this is my message to everyone today that in Bank Calculate, we are happy to collaborate. Our process to onboard any company company is very easy. We are operating only in Saudi. If you want to operate there, we are happy to collaborate. Of course. Okay. And that's why I didn't want people in the category. Right? I understand. <laughs> Uh, hi, I myself come from a bank. Yeah, my question is for over It's a limited to the big market, no doubt. But it's a, a business that's very easy to digitize. And you know, all the banks have very, and now exchange houses, they have very, very steep digital uh, products. And remittance to banks are also is pretty. So, and you know, apps like Beyond Money and others, we had been on it earlier. So what is the value proposition which can sustain them in the long term for this business? Because banks are, I mean, in the remittance business, banks are very easily out of with the digitization. Yeah, I understand your question, what is the business model? Or, uh, I mean, what would make these uh, remittance apps sustain in the long term compared to banks? I mean, I can tell you right now that our business in remittance is already sustainable. Right? We, we do not uh, incentivize the business, so we're not giving anything back to the clients in order to do remittances with us. Uh, that's why I said the first thing was creating a journey, which clients, of course, decided was easy to be onboarded. It was easy for them to text us and to be onboarded, and they decided we want to, they wanted to do deals with us and all. Then we had one element, which at, at the moment we haven't seen by the competition. So I literally asked my team, I said, let's, what is the clients normally do? They think fair rates. Every day, right? They read us the, the, the price is right and then do the transaction with the best offer. So I said, let's put it down. Let's show the clients directly instead of them shopping around, going from one app to another, sitting in front of a, a competitor and looking at the rates. Just show them in the app. This is our rate, this is the rate of competition. If you don't believe, go to check, right? And then that probably created this kind of trust because at one point the client said, instead of wasting time looking around, I know already if this rate is better or not. If it's better, do with your money. If it's not, I'll do with somebody else. And we give them the freedom. We know that some days, if you check our rates there, some days it's not the best rate. We don't hide it, right? We just tell you that in that moment, maybe for whatever reason, for treasury operation, the competitor can the better rates, or sometimes it's a market share game, obviously. Some competitors are willing to lose money and not to lose clients, right? Right, it's part of the, the, the way you work. Right? So that was the second element. And then, of course, the third element that we're working on is the uh, automation and uh, reduction, of course, of cost. We don't have branches, we don't have different workers, we don't have agents. So, inevitably, this brings down the fixed cost of the infrastructure, if you want. That allows us then to bring down the term cost and therefore also to make rates with margins, which are still sufficient for us, but not a loss. I don't know if this 
comes to device. But what do you think these advantages are long term sustainable? I mean, because banks will catch up with it. Banks will catch up. And even since we launched, I can tell you, it's, it's a fierce competition there. Now we're almost like Amazon. We adjust the rates two or three times a day. And as soon as we, we show in the app, the competition adjusts the rates immediately. Right? But that's okay. It's part of the competition. I think that the game will not be won on the best price, but there's also, again, the best features, corridors. Then, of course, we have some solution that I cannot explain on the way in the secret sauce in the competition. But it will boil it down for sure. There will be some winners and losers. The winners are the ones that bring down the internal cost. Right? And if uh, banks or competitors in the arena are not able to bring down the internal cost, then at one point, we can bring down, 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 and down. And then somebody will not be able to cope with it. Thank you very much, uh, Ryan from Citibank, a very heavily regulated bank. Uh, so just, um, it, it's actually quite interesting with uh, with Bahrain being one of the leads in uh, open banking in uh, pretty much the entire region here. Uh, I believe that uh, a lot of the framework that was implemented in Bahrain was very similar to the UK framework. And even though there were only a couple of other countries in the world that had actually picked off open banking in a very big way before Bahrain did, uh, now we see an emergence of, uh, of API open banking happening in multiple countries, as, as you alluded to uh, earlier in the conversation. Do you see um, a, a good level of standardization uh, in these multiple countries as to how open banking is being, uh, is being implemented or is being, is being looked at? Uh, and, and do you see uh, you know, a level of growth that can happen you know, in multi countries, the services that you provide? Uh, if these standardizations are actually reaching to that uh, to that level, so not sure. I think, I think Sam can answer this because he's operating in multiple countries. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, I easy to see. I, I'm actually going to find the easy way out. Yeah. Um, we're quite fortunate that open banking has hit that corporate and SME side. So, yeah. What 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 we've done. Um, is look at players like your homegrown Calgary gateway, we've got the we've got Daphne and a few others in the market, um, preferring to work with them than going directly to the banks. Um, particularly when it comes to the corporate side of things where you have makers, checkers, and um, lots of layers of authentication that's required. Um, we haven't seen that come through yet on the open banking side for SMEs. It's a lot easier on the consumer side when it's one account, um, one authorizer of the thing. So um, that's our, my, at least my answer to the question. Um, maybe I have some experience in the uh, uh, international way of doing open things. So maybe my study was really about open government. Because yeah. the it's, what the difference is for sure between the banking and government sector, same thing. It is the same thing. But I've studied the case of five Arabic countries, Bahrain was one of them, luckily, yani, uh, UAE, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and Jordan. So I am um, uh, invited and, and was lucky to um, participate in the discussion with leaders in the governments of these five countries. Um, the first one when I talked to him about open governments was the CIO of one of the ministries in one of these countries. They say no privacy, no confidentiality. I had one case, one president from one country asked me to give him some data about the students of this country in, in my country, and I refused. And I told him that why not with the consent of the customer? If I want, for example, to share my education level or certification or uh, information, to the Ministry of Education of Saudi Arabia because I'm coming from Egypt. So why don't I give my consent to this uh, Ministry of Education to get my data from Ministry of Education or High Education in Egypt and they can get my records without me having to go everywhere and test my certificate and pay time and money to get that done. So in the similar way, I think open banking one day should reach that level. Where I came from Saudi Arabia, see my accounts in Egypt as well as my accounts in Saudi Arabia. So that standard is might take time, but it will happen definitely. Today in Europe, we have over uh, twenty countries. I don't remember the exact number, but they are maybe facing some issues with the uh, internal operability, and you know they have different uh, 
language, but in, for example, in the Arabic region it might be much simpler to achieve that. But worldwide, it's going to take time. But definitely, I can promise you from sitting here today that this will happen one day, that you can open an account in New Zealand while you are sitting here in Bahrain. You can see your accounts everywhere while you are sitting in, at home. And even you can do a lot of uh, transactions, a lot of um, uh, not only uh, uh, at the level of the retail, uh, but also at SME and corporate level for sure in the future. Just that I want to add something. Uh, actually, we have here a case that it's in, if you live in Bahrain, you have, you know, Jazeel, right? Of course. Jazeel is the only bank that you can, as a GCC resident, you can onboard yourself anywhere. So uh, this is the highest level we have seen for inter-country relation. However, the, might be I might be not that optimistic about it, but this will not happen soon. But it's it's very yeah. uh, even Europe is still yeah. about to have it. Yeah, it's, uh, it's it's very tough because uh, because of many aspects actually. Uh, one thing definitely the security. But for example, I was speaking with Sam just before the session that if Saudi are allowing are allowing you to set your core banking in a different country. Of course not, they will not allow you, and not even next 10 years, you know. We still have an instance on soil that they set by word, you still have an instance on soil. So for 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 this regulatory uh for this regulatory aspect, I believe it's still very early to do so. So uh actually kind of different question, but just what you say, just keep one spot. Um, I'm coming from, um, it's a facial recognition and identity verification company, Facey. You may be know, not far. So yeah, um, the thing which you mentioned um, about uh, not a Saudi company opening like a bank account somewhere, but what do, what do you think about, uh, let's say, Spanish company or like French company opening bank account in Bahrain, let's say? Is it something that you see Viable, possible. Does it make sense? It, it will happen, but not in the not in the near future. You know, yeah. so we are here. We are here speaking about the GCC countries, which is, they are very close to each other in terms of many things. So, so if this is not happening in the GCC countries, okay, definitely, if you want to reach Europe or New Zealand or Brazil, it will take much, much time. However, what we can be, what we what we believe that the digital, the international digital banks will take over at the end. It will be regulated, but it will take over. So, uh, for me, for example, I have a Venmo account. However, I'm not I'm not a US citizen, so I still can do that. I can still can do so anyway. That in the last two weeks here, I, I'm I'm meeting with somebody here in the uh, with somebody here, and it's one of the biggest banks in the Middle East. Okay, and he said to me, you know, Ahmed, I don't I cannot onboard myself in my bank. He was a German because he have an American passport. Because he must have, so they, they don't, they cannot allow anybody from another country, even if he has the same nationality, but because he has a dual nationality to onboard himself. It's, it's a regulatory stuff. So we are here speaking about two different mindsets. Regulatory wants something, wants the financial model to be very stable and very secure, which is they are absolutely the war. But technology here wants to let drop and wants to argue everything, which is totally different mindset. Are we reaching a middle point? Yes, sometimes yes, sometimes definitely not. That's my opinion. The reason why I ask is uh, my very good friend, he has a consultant in Spain and just to give you kind of an idea, it's, <laughs> it's definitely to do with huge disruption, which I see happening in the next few years. So let's say you have a company, like small company in Spain, you're making around 1,100 euros per year. If you have an entity in Spain, you end up paying 46% in taxes. Mm -hmm. Now, it is possible for you to open a US entity, whatever you want, whatever. You can open certain in certain banks in Europe, not being resident in US. You're going to end up paying like five times less taxes. This is possible. People are getting to know it. And I mean, yeah, like I honestly came to my friend only two days ago. Open, actually, open, 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 open,
to, to, have, to have you to open that, they will tell you definitely because they're coming from Spain, they will tell you, uh, Mi casa tu casa, okay? So, come now, okay? But on that side, like, but like for banks, no, of course, I, I, I don't believe in banks, this will not happen soon. I, I, I'm not sure. It's also <laughs> good. Yeah. Uh, what's your belief? Ivan. I, I maybe can start this discussion, and uh, sorry, maybe some people will agree and some people will disagree, but I am always uh, revolutionary in that uh, aspect. Today we are living in this world. Tomorrow we are going to be in the metaverse, okay? Forget about all regulations, forget about all aspects of restriction that we have today. Very few years from now, okay, we will be all living there, okay? So all what you are saying now is going to be a reality, in the virtual reality. Okay, and in the metaverse, and I believe some countries started already moving to that verse. So tomorrow we are not going to be restricted by a lot of regulations. Uh, maybe some uh, banks will, will like to continue. I know that Ahmed is upset for me now. Maybe some banks will, will like to continue working under the relation of their countries. But I believe that a good percentage will move the, just like the startups that we have who made changes to the world. I think some of them also will move to that verse and we will have customers doing transactions there without the need to be uh, limited with any country or any currency. Uh, today, after the um, currency, uh, uh, the currency uh, unregulated, today banks, central banks are moving into the CBDC. So they start believing on having a digital currency regulated by themselves, but still, uh, the world is going to move with their um, acceptance or their rejection. It's going to happen. Um, with all my respect to their um, uh, keenness about maintaining the economy and everything. But today, what we have seen the cryptocurrency across the world is an example of people moving away from this situation. So basically, you're suggesting and to people to speak as well to move from face recognition to apes. <laughs> 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 I agree with what I'm say, like, it will happen. The, the question is, like, almost like, I mean, me personally, like, I would like to be, like, moving faster. Which uh, generation you are? X? Or a millennium? Uh, or millennium, sorry. This what? generation, why? Yeah. 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 But I just want my mentor and citizens here. Just what you mentioned about, like, let's not offer, forget it's not about regulations, also taxes. You will never be able to have. Uh, a legal entity in Spain opening an offshore account somewhere else, unless you establish a legal entity somewhere else. Okay. Yes, correct. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Then, then, once you establish a legal entity, then of course the Spanish company creates a legal entity here or anywhere else, they can open it, right? But uh, even in Europe, it's the same. But yeah, yeah, it's not so much about like avoiding tax, it's just optimizing it. In the sense that, like, if you're a small business, you know, support the club. But yeah. yeah. Sorry, just an original question, like, which I've done before. Um, you mentioned about uh, verifying people in Egypt only with space without ID document. Is it something you already do? Uh, it's just it's a vision of a founder of our company. It's like like what you said a couple of days ago. That's quite scary. Uh, what we're doing in Egypt uh, is different from other countries. But in Saudi, you don't have to have even uh, facial recognition to open the account. We have app share, so we can authenticate you through, through the username and password of app share, so, and we go through that. Uh, I think we are adopting something very soon in Saudi by Minister of Interior to have eyes to commission and crypto commission. So even uh, that will be part of our uh, solutions very soon. But it's, it's, it's not yet in Egypt. Uh, but the uh, provider is, is already existing in UAE and there are a couple of banks that yeah. use it for Yeah. Sorry, last question. One more question. Last question. Last question. I think we have another group, actually. Come uh, John, okay. uh, during the discussion, you have mentioned about uh, problems of SME in the UAE, but you haven't uh, mentioned that okay, what solutions are available and it's really that even going on. If SME opening a bank account, okay, there's another problem, but then getting with nothing. There is a difficult task. If they want to discount their bill, uh, there is a uh, like very minimum, maybe there is no product as such, there is no insurance uh, on the uh, table, something like that. So, is there any 
with your knowledge uh, of uh, fintech and startup, is there anything in the pipeline with the Sinasi or SME or discounting their bill, given they're working at the Sinasi alternate means other than the bank? Is there any solution in behind now? I'm happy to yep, respond. So, um, we're starting to, um, at least in Saudi Arabia now, have come across um, multiple sort of fintechs that are working on uh, financing for SMEs. We're working on product as well um, to help with cash flow management. Um, you know, Roberto mentioned something earlier. You have this um, decision, do we make or do we buy? So do we build something ourselves or do we go out and partner with somebody? And most of the cases with fintechs, we, because we're not licensed as a bank, we're not allowed to use the deposits that we're holding. So how do we then lend to um, our users? So that's where we need to look at creating partnerships. Those could be partnerships with uh, traditional banks. So they will uh, use their books to do the lending, but use our platform. It could be perhaps you know, your car leasing business or lending. It could be the same kind of idea there. Or we raise the money as debt and we lend that to them. And we're seeing some quite um, in, in you you've got invoice discounting and factoring going on, you've got um, um receivables of people who have digital businesses that are selling purely online digital services based on their um payment gateway revenue that they're generating from there. So there are some interesting things that fintechs are. Um, will be. Um, and I think you'll see a lot more coming in the next six to 12 months, specifically for Bahrain. I don't know, but perhaps maybe you have some residents here that are working on that, on those things too. Absolutely. There are some solutions to live, but in Bahrain, we're a company as well. You are providing financing to SME. We're building a finance, uh, we're building a lending product which we will release in the market okay. at some point, um, hopefully around the summer, inshallah. Anything else? Well, I want to say thank you to everyone for coming. Um, you know, it's been our pleasure to host you. Thank you to everyone online. Um, for joining us as well. Thank you to all of our panel members. It was a pleasure to hear more from you all, and I wish you a lovely rest of the evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.